when I was a kid, I was probably about 13 years old or 14, and I was in a basement of a friend of mine. You know, we, that's where we used to hang out, you know, and we used to listen to music, you know, and each of us would have albums and we'd challenge each other. Well, you think what you played is cool, but have you heard this? So we were doing that kind of thing. And uh, this guy came downstairs into the basement and said, I got you all today, because check this out. And he put this record on, and the bass went, boom, 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 And we all just stood there with our jaws dropped, because we never heard anything that funky. Uh, we thought it was a bass guitar playing it. We never heard a bass guitar sound like that. Well, it turns out it wasn't a bass guitar. It was Herbie Hancock playing on a bass synthesizer. But, you know, synthesizers were new at that time, and we never heard anything like it. And then we were tripping out because we'd look on the back of the album at the instruments that these guys played, and Herbie Hancock, under the instruments that he played, he had listed about 13 instruments, you know, and we hadn't heard of any of them. We didn't know what any of these instruments, what's an arp odyssey, and what's a clavinet, you know, what are all these, you know, instruments that he's playing that we've never heard of? And, and the percussionists on that album, he listed every instrument that he played, a shaker and a kabasa, and we didn't know any of these names, so it was like a a music lesson, you know, and at the same time, our heads are going like this, you know. And in the middle of that song, Herbie went to the Fender Rose and played this incredible jazz solo, and none of us knew anything about jazz. That album, The Headhunters, did so many things for us. It made us want to learn about instruments. We wanted to learn what all these instruments on the back of this album were, and we wanted to learn what jazz was, because if this is jazz, we decided that we liked jazz. What makes me impressed about Herbie Hancock is he's a complete musician, you know, he's got technique, he's got passion, he's got imagination, you know. And he, uh, every time he gets on the stage, it's a new story, you know. And I always wanted to be like that with my music as well, you know. When I walk on the stage, it's a new story, anything is possible. And also, you know, we had that Miles Davis connection, you know, we were very close to him, both of us. And um, to perform with someone who has a similar experience to you is a very nice feeling too. But it's always an honor to play with him. Herbie called me and said, look, I'm going to put together a group called Headhunters 2005, and I'd like you to play it. And I said, oh, no problem. I'm, I'm there, you know. So we got together, and, and Herbie called me before the rehearsals and said, Marcus, do you want me to send you the music to any of this stuff? I said, man, I know this music better than you do. <laughs> and in the band was Terry Lynn Carrington on drums, and Lionel Lueke played guitar, Roy Hargrove played trumpet, and Kenny Garrett played sax, and uh, Munyongo play percussion. You know, Herbie Hancock is one of the only people that became like an icon, you know, he's like a, he was able to sort of cross a lot of boundaries in music. You know, like uh, he, he reinvented himself like a, a lot of times, you know, and, and always has something to add to the whole spectrum. One of the first things that I noticed that every time he sits at the piano, Everyone takes notice because it's always something, some new sound that's going to happen. Man, I learned so much from Herbie, you know. It's never a dull moment, man, you know. It's always exciting. Uh, on and off the bandstand, he's a very wonderful person, nice human being. Actually, it, it, Herbie turned me on to Buddhism, which was a great step for me. You couldn't really get in a comfort zone playing with Herbie. You have to, you, you couldn't just play your regular stuff that you play all the time. You would have to sort of reach a little bit beyond that into something that you wouldn't normally do. And I think that, it, you know, that's something that he, he talks about during rehearsals and things like that. Don't just play the normal, don't play the two five ones. Don't play the, you know, the stuff you play all the time. Just try to reach for something that's going to be different and uh, innovative. Well, I met Herbie through the Monk Institute in Los Angeles. Um, 2001, I did the audition for the school, and uh, it was the judge. Play with Herbie is, uh, you know, it's a blessing, you know, because exactly like Miles, he, he, he won't tell you what to play and how to play it. Basically, it's like if he hire you, it means um, he believe on, you know, he believe on you and he lets you do your thing, you know. So every single, I remember at the beginning, like, what, three, four years ago, when I start playing with him, you know, after the gig, I would go to him and say, man, I call him master. Can you tell me, I mean, anything wrong or anything else? Say, oh, no, man. You know, do your thing. And in three, four years, until now, you know, it happens sometimes, somebody's lost on stage or Herbie doesn't even raise his head to look at you or whatever. He just keep playing. 
He's improvising at the same time he's listening around whatever is happening. If the bass player drop a beat, uh, drop a chord, he join him in a second, you know. The souvenir of the Headhunters 05, well, first was to have, to be surrounded by all those guys, you know, and I really, I felt like I was the baby of the band, you know, and they, they did take care of me, you know. The best souvenir, I remember, it was in the dressing room. In the dressing room was Herbie, Kenny Garrett, you know, Marcus, and the three of, of them was talking about Miles, you know. And one says something, oh yeah, he always say that, you know, like, you know, oh yeah, you're like talking about your watch, you're talking about random thing, you know? So I felt like I was, you know, just at that period of when they were with mice, you know? You move your body in eight notes. That yeah, yeah, right. Go. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's, is that it? Is that, is that? Is that? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, I heard people like, like, uh, oh, you just count all in once. No, you have to count in halves. You got to count in halves. <laughs> you count in halves? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> right. I, would, I was just doing it like shit would be on the downbeat, but it would be on the upbeat. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, right, right. So I figured, okay, I'll just stand right there. Downbeat, upbeat. Yeah, right, right. Downbeat, upbeat. That works too, that works too, right? That's, that worked like a motherfucker. You do a long, Oh, yeah, it worked. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time I'm doing this with Herbie Hancock. I've got so many questions, I should do it in front of you guys so you guys can benefit also. The first thing I want to know, what are the similarities, if any, between the great artists that you've worked with? Can you think of things that you've found are in common between Miles and Dizzy and Joni Mitchell and all the people you've worked with? Is there anything that you can think of that they all, they each possess? They stand up for what they believe in. Miles stood up for social issues. Um, just the idea of being true to yourself, that's what Miles stood up for. You know, being true to yourself through music. I mean, Miles was, everybody knows he was not a perfect human being, <laughs> you know. He had his, his moments, you know, right, but, sure. but underneath all of his demons, there was this extremely bright, creative human being that all he cared about was being providing a, a means by which other musicians could stand up for themselves. And he cared about the audience. He, he cared care so much that he sacrificed his whole opinion about him, you know, putting his back to the audience and all of that, just to make the music better. 
The reason for him putting his back to the audience, the same reason that an orchestra conductor puts his back to the audience. He faced the drummer and did a musical conversation with the drummer. He faced the bass player, you know, faced the piano. That's all he was doing, just trying to make the music better. You know? he, he would face me when I was in the band. And he started talking to me one time, and I was like, man, I can't hear you, Miles. Because, <laughs> you know, his voice is kind of raspy, and, and the band was loud. And, but I really want to hear, I want to know if I'm, am I flat, am I in the wrong key? But, and finally I heard what he said. He said, how you like my shoes? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what, what? Oh, those, those are some bad shoes, Ma. And it wasn't usually like that. I mean, what Herbie said is absolutely true, but the one story where he wasn't conducting anybody. He said, what, what size you wear? I can get Cicely to get you a pair if you like them. I was like, okay, Miles, I'm trying to concentrate on this music here, okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. How you so, like my shoes? How you like my shoes? That's the same thing. You they were nice. They were nice serious shoes, by the way. as a heart attack, like, right? Sweating and carrying on and like, yeah, right. Oh, okay, let me relax and look at your <laughs> yeah, shoes. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But isn't it funny how But he long... wouldn't say, he wouldn't say, right. why don't you relax? Right, right. Isn't it funny no, how, he, how long it takes? To it out. How long it takes mm -hmm. for you to decipher some of the things <laughs> that he said to you, you know? You're sitting there going. <laughs> 